I'm Greg Moore. I'm the director of the Real Estate Development and Design Program at UC Berkeley. And the question that we're posing here is whether rezoning is part of the answer or the answer, part of the answer uh, to Southern California's housing crisis. So let's see, uh, let's review a little bit what has happened. So this graph shows that for much of the post-war period from the 50s through the 80s, California was building about 200,000 units a year. Uh, that slowed down in the 90s and early 2000s by a little bit more than half to about 125 or so thousand. And since the Great Recession, we've been producing more around the 50,000, 60,000 units per year. So we are producing essentially four times less housing that we did uh, you know, back in the day. And what's curious about this is, of course, is that it's not like California has stopped growing. Uh, in fact, we've been pretty consistently growing since the Second World War. There's a little bit slow down in the 70s, picking back up in the 80s, slowing down a little bit more in the, in the 90s. Uh, but we continue to grow uh, very consistently. So the idea that some, somehow we're not going to be producing housing is, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, at least in the Bay Area, we're producing at about seven, uh, for every seven jobs, we're producing one housing unit. And sustainable is usually seen as somewhere between one to one or one to one and a quarter or so. So seven to one is clearly out of, uh, out of whack. So I, uh, you know, we might want to add, you know, our, our state motto is Eureka. We might want to change that to the rents too damn high or at least combine the two. <laughs> Uh, half, the, this is even a few years old from 2016, but half the state's households are unable to afford uh, the cost of housing in their local markets, which basically means they're spending more than 30%, and in many cases, that's more than 50%. So this is you know, something that we see all the time. Uh, yay, we're not last. Uh, we're second last <laughs> in the nation in terms of housing production. This is the numbers that you see the governor and others talking about in terms of we already have a two million uh, unit deficit of underbuilding essentially with that first graph for the last 30 years. Uh, and then going forward uh, to 2025, we need another million and a half. So this is a couple years out of date, but that's where this three and a half million unit uh, thing comes from. And what this shows, if you direct your attention to kind of the bottom right of the, of the table, what essentially this means is that anybody that's earning 50% uh, or less of the area median income are spending, uh, virtually 100% are spending more than 30%. And if you're less than 30% AMI, which is very low and extremely low, it's 100% of those folks are spending more than half their income. Uh, when you're spending that levels of income, you don't have much left over, uh, and life becomes pretty tough, and that goes to the, to the issues that Richard talked about, about people leaving. Uh, I want to give a little historical perspective in this, you know, uh, and I'm going to focus specifically on the city of Los Angeles, but I want to kind of, for those of you who understand and were around in the late 60s and early 70s, you'll realize that was a very... Uh, big change happening, people were concerned. It was the birth of the environmental movement. People were concerned about overpopulation, about the uh, limits to growth. Uh, and so what this led to was a whole series of not only environmental regulation, but uh, changes to our land use regime. And I'm gonna th show a couple of quotes here which you might think are probably, people still might say this, uh, that we need fewer people here, that it's totally fine if there's not people coming into my neighborhood. We really want to constrain growth. Uh, and this was sort of back in 1970. But this one's really curious to me, uh, that one of the strategies to limit growth is to, or to, to control birth rates is to free zoning. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I'm having, deciding am I going to have kids, the first thing I check is not the zoning code. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the idea that somehow uh, by constraining land use policy that is actually a, going to constrain growth uh, is somewhat uh, a stretch. What you end up with is just making life harder for people that are coming and already here. Uh, so I'll just walk through just very quickly what happened in Los Angeles. This is the city of Los Angeles, but uh, 
Uh, I just gave a talk a couple days ago in Santa Barbara, and it turns out the, the, the graph looks almost identical in Santa Barbara, which is a much, much, much smaller town. But back in 1960, uh, we had what you would call very liberal zoning. Uh, we had a population around two and a half million. If you added up all the zoning and you multiplied that by uh, the average unit household size in different parts of the city, you would have a capacity of about 10 million people. So that's a very, you could almost say, speculative relationship, 25%. And so what happened over the course of uh, the 60s and 70s is a very uh, extreme reduction of these um, zoning capacities, and you see some of the some of the things that came in line. There was a big issue in the in the late '60s about bribery, and that led to this uh, citizens committee that really looked at and made recommendations to to lower the density. And so there wasn't really a question in the late '60s, early '70s that you were going to downzone. It was a question of how much. Uh, so by 70, it was 7.5 million. By 1980, it was closer to 4 million. So we essentially took out 60% of the zoning capacity uh, over that period. And you can see, of course, you know, this is happening in concert with uh, CEQA being introduced, uh, Prop 13 comes online. So there's lots of complicated factors that are playing out. So that was sort of the first wave, if you can see at the top of our community plans. We massively downzoned this. The city planning department tried to quell this and not have it quite so uh, um, drastic. The city planning commission at the time was much more citizen oriented and they wanted even more drastic. Council basically picked somewhere in between those two. So what's happened since that first wave in the second and third and now just beginning the third wave of community plans in LA is that we are adjusting those things, but we're not keeping pace with the population growth. So you can see, you know, from being 25% population to capacity by 1980, it was about 75%. And not, probably not coincidentally, 1980 was probably the last time that incomes and house prices in Los Angeles were more or less in line with one another. And what's happened ever since, as you can see as we play it out, as you can see, the population is catching up to the capacity uh, to the point where, you know, this is 2016, but it actually hasn't changed that much in the last couple of years, that we're at 93% capacity. And if you look at what we did in the city of Los Angeles, and by the way, you can only look at this uh, respect, pro, you know, in, in hindsight, because the city is divided up into 35 community plans uh, that are more or less plan kind of independently of one another. There is a, a framework, but, uh, you know, it's hard for overall the city to understand, you know, what's actually happening. But it turns out that from 1970 to today, there was roughly, uh, you know, 300,000 or so uh, more people that were allowed by zoning, but we, the population's increased by about a million. So. How does that work? People are doubling, tripling up. There's lots of garage conversions. And we're, we have a release valve, which is that we try to do uh, general plan amendments to get around what the community plans are, are telling us. Um, and and the, play, the basic gist is that if we don't do something about this by 2030, we will uh, be in serious trouble. So what, what this leads to, this question, is you know, how much zoning capacity is necessary to create a healthy housing market. Uh, we had it more or less in the 70s, uh, maybe up to 1980, and, and since then it's been really difficult. The other point I want to make, uh, and I'm wrapping up here, is just that what happened over that period when we were making those adjustments is that it wasn't even across the city. We actually took out about 17% of the capacity uh, on the west side. Overall, it went up about 10%. But you can see what's happening is we're putting density, directing density to certain parts of the city, mostly the East Valley, east side, or what we basically think of as central Los Angeles, south central Los Angeles, uh, and taking it out of the west side and the west, and not so much in the West Valley. So I just show this to show, you know, what what each of these 35, well, yeah, there's a few that are in the tail of LA, but what uh, the community plans have done in terms of adding or taking out density. The areas in black are where density was added uh, 
uh, the areas in red were where density was taken out. So, and you, the developers in the room would say, well, that's interesting because that's basically uh, a mirror image of market demand. So where do, where do people want to live? They want to live on the west side. That's where the projects are going to pencil most. So we're putting density in areas where it's not necessarily going to happen. I would also point out that that is also more or less related to the racial makeup of the city. So the west side is the most white area. Uh, east sides are more um, Latino areas. And so there's a kind of interesting political dynamic there. One of the other things I had looked at is just the impact of community associations, neighborhood associations. Uh, and you see what, where you have a lot of neighborhood act activity is the area precisely where you got a lot of downzoning. And so with that, that kind of as a backgrounder, we're going to open this up and try to understand, you know, what role that rezoning or upzoning can play in uh, in sort of tackling our housing crisis. So we have Con Howe uh, on the far left, former uh, planning director. Oh, it's gone away. Can we get that back? Well, anyway, uh, so <laughs> we have Martha, uh, uh, Martha, Kevin, and Sharon, uh, and we'll just dive into the panel now. I'm going to start uh, with Khan. Uh, as the former planning director, you are on the spot all the time. The general question that I'd like to ask is, under what circumstances does upzoning work? Which is to say, under what circumstances does it actually lead to more housing being produced? Um, first of all, it's nice not to always be on the, <laughs> on the hot seat uh, in the last 10 years. But um, uh, first of all, I think uh, the previous presentation made clear zoning is supposed to implement a plan or help implement a plan. It's not the end it, it, in and of itself. It's a means to the end. So I think the, the first two criteria for effective zoning that will produce housing is one, that it, it is implementing a plan and you're, you're trying to make something happen in an area. And the second one, which is often overlooked, is there has to be a market or economics that will actually do something with, with that zoning. Um, I would dispute a little bit your analysis because um, we could uh, give any zoning capacity in some parts of the city and it wouldn't produce anything because there's no market and the, the, the economics aren't there. So it's a little bit of a theoretical thing to, to just talk about zoning capacity. You have to look at zoning capacity in relationship to the market and the economics. And because um, markets and economics change a lot faster than zoning, zoning's a conservative tool. And um, therefore, I think the, the, the way that the, the judge by where you should put a lot of effort on rezoning is where is zoning the barrier to housing production? Um, it's kind of like but for. If but for the zoning, we could actually see housing produced in an area where we want to see housing. And I, I think, frankly, the, maybe the clearest example of that, uh, it's now 20 years old, but the, the uh, um, adaptive reuse ordinance, where uh, clearly the city wanted uh, downtown to have residential and, and, and uh, reuse older buildings. But at the same time, the zoning required people to get front yard variances, <laughs> side yard variances, density uh, variances, et cetera. So simply by removing that barrier of the zoning, we, we called it unzoning rather than, because it was a remarkably simple change in the zoning code is just removing stuff. Um, it, it, and because there was a market, and partly, by the way, the reason there was a market, because these buildings were producing very little revenue, and therefore they were inexpensive to buy, um, as uh, Tom Gilmore could <laughs> tell you. Um, it, it produced that ordinance, or that change, produced uh, in 20 years about 20,000 units. Uh, and maybe more importantly, it created a housing market that then meant new construction, uh, which has happened really in the last uh, since the recession, downtown, you know, produced uh, thousands of more units. Yeah, and it's, it, downtown is certainly a success story in that respect, but it's also, the flip side is, it's, it's almost like it, 
downtown and South Park are the safe areas where we are allowed to put density. And going back to your point about market, well, if, if we should be putting zoning and upzoning in areas where there is market demand, why aren't we upzoning the west side of the city? Well, um, I first of all th th think that the, the underlying city plan, and Kevin mm -hmm. can speak to this more than I can, but is to encourage housing development along commercial corridors. And the, the good thing about that strategy is the commercial corridors crisscross the whole region, not just the city of LA, but the whole region. And these are uh, often low rise, underperforming uh, commercial corridors. And by replacing, you know, mini malls and, and, and kind of low, low energy retail in an industry, which by the way, that is a land use that's kind of dissipating anyway, uh, and replacing it with four or five, six story apartment buildings with mixed use if there's an economics. Um, that really, I think, is, is the best strategy. And I think, you know, we'll let Kevin describe why it's hard to implement that. <laughs> But, um, and maybe we'll come back to this, but I think w one of the reasons is, uh, frankly, because of uh, uh, how difficult it is for city planning or individual applicants to rezone because uh, part of it is uh, litigation through CEQA or the threat of litigation. Um, it's, it's a very difficult process and anything that can be done to simplify that process uh, will make large-scale rezonings uh, easier to do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. In LA, you know, a lot of the density is going into places like South and Southeast in the new, in the new community plans, but the reality is our West Side plans are not planning for more density, and so that's, I think we need to tackle that. We need to think about the political challenges that represents, but that's a big issue. So one of the ways that um, at least up in the Bay Area, we're trying to get more density is through empowering our transit authorities to um, take more of the lead in terms of land use. So uh, what, what happened in the Bay Area is you have BART, but you have all these communities along the line that don't want to upzone near it. So what's happened is the state legislature has granted BART land use authority on parcels it actually owns around the stations, which is a very uh, extreme almost way to deal with it. Martha, what do you think about this? Is this a, a strategy to empower MTA to, to upzone around all the stations in, in LA County? Well, having been the chief planning officer for Metro, um, I would oppose it um, because uh, the planners at the tra transit authority are really not land use planners. What we did at Metro when I was there was we recognized the issue, and every, I think everybody knows we're building out an extensive transportation system here, a lot of new rail transit through measures R and M. And um, we, we saw that many of the cities that it goes through, there are 88 cities in this county, you know, it's not just the city of LA. Mm -hmm. And many of the cities that the transit lines will go through don't have a lot of resources, don't have a lot of staff to, to do any rezoning. So we created a grant program so our solution was more to empower the communities, <coughs> let them do the land use planning, but give them some money to, to actually get through a hurdle, whatever it was, whether it was creating an EIR or doing a, a, a general plan or a specific plan, whatever it might be, that would allow them to, to increase the density. That's, that would be my solution. And, I don't and know how it's working and that's, out. that's great for communities that actually want to do the density. What do you right. do about communities that have no interest in upzoning, period. So they're not even gonna apply for that grant because they're like, we don't want the density. So right. how do you deal with the, the fact that some communities are not willing to do their fair share? Los Angeles, and that puts obviously, and, and Kevin will speak to this, yeah. uh, the burden on Los Angeles to kind of carry the load, but what do you do about communities that don't want density? Well, when you're, when you're running Metro, it's not your problem, I hate to say it. <laughs> It is an issue. I don't know the answer to it. It's, it's, um, but I think you, you know, you've got to, you've got to work with the local commu community. It's, it's got to be a plan that they want. Um, I know there are all sorts of initiatives at the state level to try to take over uh, the the local authority for for land use and and all that. I think it's not a good idea. It's too crude a tool. You need to have the interaction of local communities. I mean, it's a, 
it's a fight worth fighting for, but it's um, but it's got to it's got to include everybody in the in the debate. Yes. Well, let's get back to that. We'll talk about <laughs> SB 50 and and some of these other state <laughs> initiatives. Uh, but but speaking of you know initiatives that are really meant to incentivize development to provide more affordable housing, I wanted to ask Kevin. Um, you know, does, does, it, does this work? Does it work to incentivize uh, developers to create new uh, affordable housing? How has it worked in, in Los Angeles? How has the transit oriented communities incentives worked? If you can give us a kind of update on that, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, and really uh, building off of where I think Con and Martha left it, we do have long range plans in Los Angeles. How we implement those plans, I think, is really of critical importance to this group in terms of aligning the zoning with those plans. We have what's called the regional centers, uh, Hollywood, Century City, Westwood. There are identified areas that are our growth engines, plus the corridors on those areas. So in some instances, we've had success uh, building off of Martha's uh, uh, grant program. Uh, the city did just recently adopt the Expo Rail Transit Neighborhood Program. We call them a tran transit neighborhoods, not TOD, not the word development. <laughs> they are transit neighborhoods. But it was one of the largest, although it's not going to solve the problem, but it's one of the largest upsellings we had on the west side. And we did ultimately achieve neighborhood support with, with that plan. Um, it was litigated by additional neighbors, um, but uh, we, we feel that we'll get that plan up and running and it is adopted, which is really a win for us to show that we can align transit and neighborhoods together. Another option is the community plans, which I, I love the reference to community plans. I've been working on them for 20 years with uh, my former boss, Khan, here. Um, and that's really where the capacity comes into play, the zoning, the discussions at a local level to build. But in terms of some success stories, we've also had some initiatives, you know, kind of land in our, in our laps. The uh, Measure JJJ initiative, which was adopted in 2017, included a call for the planning department, actually, was really kind of a rare uh, instruction to develop a transit-oriented communities program. And that had um, the idea of aligning development incentives, or essentially bonus zoning, around different transit stations. And I think one of the things that, um, that made that work is that it was initiative driven. It did not have to go through an adoption process beyond the initiative. It also, as an initiative, it was not subject to CEQA, although we have a lawsuit against that right now, which we're working through, but that's my position. It was not subject to CEQA. So it was basically immediately rolled out. And also, maybe building to Martha, um, we created a tiered system where it was not just, if you're, if you're next to a, a transit station, it's here are your zones, you can build five stories. There was a tiering of four systems of you know, everything from heavy rail down to two rapid buses to one rapid bus to just a good bus. Um, and it also only kicked in at basically five units or more as your base zoning. Because the idea was, and I think it, it was fascinating to hear the Minneapolis story, but the idea was that we don't necessarily have to override local zoning with this tool. We can do that in our community plans and kind of finesse that zoning, but it has worked um, to the point of right now, and I'm sorry to ramble on a little bit, but uh, over about half of our incoming entitlements in the city of LA for residential construction are using the transit-oriented communities program. That's within two years, we've seen basically over half of our work shift to that program. So I think that program is successful. Maybe other programs have not been successful. Yeah, and, and it, but it depends on getting substantial density bonuses of 80% yeah. increases to density. Are you worried that it's creating a kind of bifurcated market, which basically you're pushing all of the density to transit areas and that means they're going to be concrete buildings, they're going to be tall buildings, expensive buildings to build. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're building more affordable housing because we get more set-aside units, but the market rate units that come out of that are extraordinarily expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, Richard mentioned that, that you know, our ridership is going down, and part of the reason is because the people who are transit dependent are not able to afford increasingly uh, to live right next to the transit stations. And, and so there's a kind of double-edged sword to this, this issue. Right. We had done a study that showed that there was actually less production outside of those uh, transit-oriented areas. And so that, that becomes a, an issue where you're producing either set-aside affordable units or really expensive market rate units, but nothing in between. Mm -hmm. Is that a concern for the city? Um, I, think, I think you raise a lot of uh, points there. I think in terms of um, successful methods where you have density bonuses or incentives, you do build more of both. It's not, and I think the alternative is really something like inclusionary zoning, mm 
where you have, okay, you can build 100 units, now 10 of those have to be you know, subsidized. I think through these incentive programs, number one, they are opt-in, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. Number two, the densities work out, like the bonuses are very high, so it's really a market decision on whether to proceed or not, and we have seen people take us up on those incentives. So on the end of the day, we have hopefully more of both types of units, but you're, tr you're right, the cost is born in that. I think the issue of gentrification, the issue of displacement, the issue of how do we grow is becoming more and more critical, and I think the idea of aligning development along commercial corridors, minimizing direct displacement. There's a lot of discussion about indirect displacement these days as well. So I think, although it is difficult to talk about, having mixed income housing as part of that solution is becoming more and more critical to showing that although this building is not gonna solve the world with its six units, um, it can tell the story how this building is coming into a neighborhood where it is providing some additional affordable units locally. Could I just jump in on one point that uh, Kevin made is uh, about the choice. These aren't requirements, you have to do this or you can't build. It's the, the way that TOC, the way that mm -hmm. Density Bonus Ordinance, others uh, of these, they're options for developers. And I think that choice is very important because um, everyone doesn't see the same opportunity on the same site and sites are different and so mm -hmm. two of the key variables in, in all of those ordinances is that there's there's a level of predictability or certainty because there's you know if you do this you get this you can pick one from column a two from column b etc so it, it's a combination of predictability and 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 certainty uh with flexibility so it's uh and it, it gives the development community choices, um, and I think that's a lot more effective than, than just uh, you have to do this and that's all you can do. Great. I want to bring in Sharon here. Sharon is from Seattle, uh, and Seattle's been doing some interesting things, and especially around zoning, to, um, to provide incentives for building more affordable housing. Maybe you could give us a, a sense of what Seattle's doing that we, we should learn from. Well, absolutely. So in Seattle, there's been a major upzone in uh, multifamily commercial areas, and surprisingly, there's also a major upzone in single-family neighborhoods, not unlike what Heather was talking about. And um, the upzone in multifamily neighborhoods is basically called a mandatory housing affordability. So developers can get additional height, FAR, density, um, now what's different is that it's not necessarily inclusionary. You could build the units in your complex or you can contribute to a fund with the Office of Housing. Um, but because there were a number of lawsuits, it took so long for the um, mandatory you know, um, affordable housing to be put in place. So we've had like um, tons of um, market rate developments that have gone up um, that have not, um, we've not captured the affordable units. So right now, I'm sorry to say, there's only um, 51 units have been included in the buildings as mixed income, and 15 um, million has been contributed to the fund. But the um, mayor is um, estimating that this method would increase um, affordable housing by um, 6,000 units, which is not, which is not very much. Um, and on the single family side, most of Seattle, like 70% is zoned single family. It's got those you know, nice little single family houses all over the place. So um, they just voted to, um, like Minneapolis, to allow um, not only a second um, accessory or detached unit, but also a third. And they got rid of the home ownership requirement that it had to be um, home owner occupied. They also allowed, I don't know why, but they also allowed um, that it could also be used for Airbnb. Um, there are some restrictions around that in terms of like which neighborhoods or, um, you know, um, each, each um, private owner can only have two Airbnbs anyway. So there's some, there's some controlling factors around that. Uh, but it also says that if you want to do your third um, accessory dwelling unit or detached unit, then it has to meet green standards and affordability. Um, but there's also another program that um, you might be interested in, but um, there's a lot of critics around this, which is if you include 20 or 25% of your units as affordable to workforce folks, then your whole entire building would be property tax exempt. 
So that's called the multifamily um, tax exemption program. And um, there's a, it's generated about 4,400 units of affordable housing, and it's in place for 12 years. Um, so, and you can opt out, a uh, for-profit developer can opt out at any time. So you could have this like huge luxury high rise, and as long as you set aside 20 or 25 percent um, for um, lower wage workers, then um, your entire property tax is exempt for that building. And there's also um, similar for condominiums. And so, of course, the housing advocates are very critical of this because um, it means that, um, you know, the, the money that um, you're exempting from property tax, like millions and millions, right, could have been used for um, direct subsidies for leveraging more affordable housing. So we have a lot of um, really um, interesting ideas to um, incentivize um, affordable housing. That's great. I mean, it's interesting. We at the Turner Center up at Berkeley, we actually uh, made a proposal which was like that. We were not going so far to say as you get the entire thing uh, abated with a percentage, but more directly in line with the percentage. So, but using the tax system to incentivize landlords to keep uh, prices down. I just want to add a footnote to that because um, the developers, the market rate developers, actually wanted that state law, it's actually a state law that en enables um, local authorities to enact it, like, you know, city by city. Um, the for-profit developers actually wanted to allow it for um, conversion of existing housing. And the state legislature said, well, that would mean more displacement. Um, mm -hmm. If you had speculators um, come in and take a sort of modest multifamily building, and then they got a property tax exemption and they fix up the cabinets and the you know, granite countertops um, and then, and then um, raise the rent because we have no rent control or rent stabilization at this point. Um, and so they, the state legislature refused to allow it for existing housing. Well, your, your invocation of the state is an interesting question because we're having this debate here in California. What role should the state play in land use and zoning? Uh, I think that folks like Scott Weiner would say, you know, local municipalities have always had the, the ability to do the right thing, but hasn't, haven't always done it. What we've heard from is the big cities, Minneapolis, Seattle, Los Angeles, are doing their part and more. There's a lot of municipalities that are not. And so what would you say the state's role is to, uh, to kind of put some pressure on local municipalities that aren't doing their fair share. <laughs> Martha has strong feelings, so <laughs> let, let her speak. <laughs> well, I, but I have, I'm not sure exactly what the role is. I think I just feel strongly about, about uh, the crudeness of SB 50 and the in inappropriateness of it. And the irony of it that if, if um, zoning can, if, if, if densities can increase anywhere within, what is it, a thousand miles of a, a Every a bus or a train running every ten not, minutes. Not miles. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't mean. I didn't mean miles. Quarter mile. Anyway, quarter mile. Right. Um, the irony of it is that the guy who schedules the buses at Metro is suddenly in charge of land use in all of Los Angeles County, which is, you know, which is a pretty, a pretty silly, uh, pretty silly result. But it, the the tool is just is too crude. I mean, if if the cities are not building enough housing, something has to happen, but I don't know exactly what the role, you, you guys have well, been in the trenches in City Hall. You would well, I, I do believe that the state has an important role, and I think it's beginning to take it more and more, and, and I think, yes, there's problems with SB 50, but I think the, the number of communities, and this is definitely true in the Bay Area, but, but uh, as well as in this region, um, Communities just aren't going to, they, they don't believe in, in uh, transit and housing uh, being connected. So even if there's a grant program, as, as I think you, you referenced, uh, they'll not apply for the grants. They don't want it. So I think there is definitely a, a role for the state. I just think that it's fair to say that SB 50 in its previous form was an overreach. But I suspect we all think it'll come back in some form that uh, is doable and, and, and can be effective. I have three, I actually have three examples. Um, and one of them is um, I have a colleague, um, Dora Gallo, with um, a community of friends. Mm -hmm. And um, Assembly Bill 1197 
-hmm. which was passed by, I guess, the California legislature, allows um, if you build permanent supportive housing, um, it basically waives um, having to go through um, CEQA, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's very interesting that um, LA was designated in the state bill um, because there's a housing crisis, homelessness crisis, so permanent supportive housing does not have to go through the same <coughs> level of environmental review. Now, in Washington State, the legislature just passed a bill saying that um, a um, local government or county um, has to consider a density bonus for any property, whether it's single family or multifamily, um, that's owned or controlled by a church or religious organization. So if, as long as they provide um, affordable housing for homeless people, that um, they should get a dense, density bonus. And it specifically says single family or multifamily sites, which um, I think says something about, you know, if you have um, church owned or church controlled property and a church has a long term mission to serve the needs of the community, then uh, a community should um, consider upzoning or allowing for this. The other thing that the Washington State Legislature adopted was that any land, um, like surplus or staging land, that's um, owned by a transit authority, 80% um, of it has to be conveyed at nominal cost or free um, to a nonprofit or um, public agency for low income housing. Or if it's not conveyed for free or low cost, it has to be sold and the proceeds um, benefit um, low income housing. So that's 80% of transit authority land. Can I just hit the buzzer too? <laughs> um, and, and thank you. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned AB 1197. So I think um, some of the discussion is there is a real crisis. The state is trying to do things. Is it doing it the right way or not? I'm not going to weigh in on that, but I think there's a lot of people that will. Um, there's an issue with local governments. There's a perception that local governments don't want to approve housing, and that can be a perception that's true or not true, depending on your experience. So that's 1.0. That's a problem everyone's looking at. There's a 2.0 problem as well. For the governments that are choosing to approve housing, we're getting uh, challenged as well. So AB 1197 was a response to the city of LA's permanent supportive housing ordinance. So the city of LA passed an ordinance which said, you know what, we're going to create objective standards. We're going to put them on, uh, on public. You can opt in. And if you follow these hoops, you can build basically permanent supportive housing by right up to 120 units on a lot that's zoned for eight units. Um, then that went into court under CEQA, and we have been uh, in court for over a year and a half. So that bill was actually the state coming in and saying, you know what, we are going to say that that's void from CEQA, have a nice day. That's going to court in December. We'll see if we're successful in striking down that lawsuit. But it speaks to the fact that even when the cities are successful at upzoning, which I think is the next conference next year, <laughs> that we are still being challenged and, and uh, struggling with meeting our other environmental laws, both on project levels, there's CEQA for projects. CEQA is also required for long range planning. We have to show and document those tens of thousands of units that we have cleared them down to a level of no significant impact or have an EIR with the same level of scrutiny. Now, I'm, not, I'm saying it's a good thing, but that burden, if you can imagine how difficult it is to do a burden or an EIR on your one tower, which is a big deal, try it for a 20 square mile area that may have 200 to 300,000 people. It's, it's a big hurdle for local governments to take on. Well, the elephant in the room, of course, is that you know, a lot of single family homeowners don't want to see change. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the points that these state legislators would say, and it goes back to a point that uh, Heather made about giving the local municipal politicians cover is that there could potentially be some framework that comes down from the state level that allows people to do the right thing without suffering the local political consequences. Is that a viable strategy? I mean, is, is that have legs? Well, no, I, I think so. When, when we created the density bonus ordinance, uh, we would say, well, the state's making us do it. You know, the, mm -hmm. blame them. And so I do, I think the state has to put backbone in, in, in localities to do what they really should do and many of them mm -hmm. want to do. I, I agree with Martha, it has to be done the right way, but um, they, I, I think that is key. Uh, we have to remember um, uh, land use is really a state, um, it's not a national uh, uh, 
policy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a state by state policy, but they devolve it to local communities. And so they have every right to, to take back <laughs> what they have devolved. Um, the only thing I would say, since you mentioned about single family, it's interesting that so much, this was first of all a multi-family housing conference, not, not a <laughs> housing conference, and I think it's interesting so much has turned on what to do in single family homes. I, I would say, and Kevin could speak to this, but the, the, the liberalization of ADUs, or uh, accessory dwelling units, is bound to have some impact, but I personally believe one of the strengths of the city and the region are stable single family neighborhoods at all income levels. I mean, if this was, I don't know Minneapolis that well, but if single family home areas were all very high income, that's a different situation. In this region, um, you know, most of middle class housing and a good bit of l l lower cost housing is, is single family homes. So I don't think the strategy to to radically change those neighborhoods is, is a good one. I think instead, the strategy of, of building on these commercial corridors and replacing low-level commercial with multifamily, which is what I presume most of you people do, I think that's the strategy to go what, ahead. But what about areas where you have single-family homes <clears throat> right next to transit stations? So the argument goes like this from the state's point of view. We're spending billions of dollars on all of this new infrastructure, and we're not letting people live next to it and use it. So are, is there an opportunity to think about particular areas right next to transit stations that could be upzoned? But, but see, that there's very few of those examples, because first of all, the rail system in this region, and I suspect all parts of California, was industrial. There was freight trains, and so those land uses are manufacturing. That's really, the expo line shows that. Uh, and so you're changing manufacturing zone land to permit residential, which is a, a good thing. And the other thing is where there's a bus system, those buses aren't going on, uh, on small streets in the middle of neighborhoods, they're going on right. commercial corridors. So yes, there are some examples of single family home areas close to transit, but you know, not many. And I, I, I think it's a fine land use category to have a low rise single family neighborhood crisscrossed by four, five, six, seven story mixed use buildings and commercial corridors. Well, it's interesting. If you, if you actually look at the data, it, it doesn't support that in that there are actually a lot of areas that are under zone next to transit. And so, oh. you know, that is what we're dealing with. I mean, look at Westwood here in, in Los Angeles, look at South Pasadena. You know, you've got light rail running through these areas, but there's no zoning capacity next to those. And so I think that's part of a challenge. Chair? Well, I just wanted to move back to the whole um, issues you raised around barriers and legal battles and NIMBY and YIMBY stuff. I think that's very important. Now, this is not a state law, but um, you know we have to apply for um, tax credits from our um, housing you know, housing commission, and um, we actually got them to put in a anti-NIMBY provision in the allocation of tax credits. Mm -hmm. So there is a in the policy in the tax credit policy, there's a provision that says if um, a if there's a lawsuit or um, pushback from the community um, because they don't want low-income housing in their neighborhood. Um, that the um, commission will actually, um, you know, I mean, you know, that's the whole strategy, right? You, you, you get a challenge to your permits or land use um, in hopes that they will delay you and then you will lose your financing, right? That's, that's like the whole game here, right? So there's a provision in the Washington State Housing Finance Commission that if you um, are about to lose your allocation of tax credits, the commission will give you a new allocation if it's a NIMBY battle. So we think that that is very, very positive and very, very helpful. And we are right now um, um, using that. We, we have, a, can you imagine this? We are building 50 units in a small town that's a naval town on Whidbey Island, right? We're doing 25 units for veterans and 25 units for um, low wage workers. And um, the, some of the, um, you know, they're taking us, we have the permits approved and they're taking us the downtown merchants are taking us to um, um, Superior Court to um, try and, you know, get us um, 
get our um, permits stopped. So the commission is actually giving us a new allocation of um, credits. That's, that's great. Seems like we would do. We have, we have five minutes left. So for those of you, are there questions? Start making your way. Okay, let's get some mics down to folks. <laughs> um, while mics are coming, I would just pose to the panel. So if we don't like SB 50, if we don't like this heavy handed, what does a, a kind of state level uh, program look like that would be acceptable to local communities? Reform CEQA, <laughs> reduce CEQA litigation. Um, I mean, I, I think yeah. everyone, what, uh, when's the last time you heard of a CEQA litigation that actually involved an environmental issue? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, question? Yeah, right here. Uh, at the federal level, uh, specifically uh, HUD, what can be done to help this uh, housing situation? Role for the feds in all this. You know, I think the federal government provides a lot of, I think, the subsidized uh, vouchers, a lot of our, that discussion, I think we had a little bit earlier about the, the split in the subsidy of low-income housing. I think it has, in the past, done um, some grants for long-range planning um, around kind of the choice and empowerment zones, but I think the federal government currently, I don't think people are looking to the federal government uh, for assistance on the housing front, but certainly I think we would welcome any housing assistance we could get. Well, one example, actually, we're big, our firm is a big believer in opportunity zones. Mm -hmm. And that's when you think about it, it's just tax, it's federal tax money right. that's supporting development in certain areas. We have a project, uh, two opportunity zone projects, one in the Bay Area and one in, in uh, the LA region. So um, I think that there are ways uh, that have actually nothing to do with land use, but tax policy. Well, one of the, everybody probably in the room knows that the, the largest housing subsidy that the federal government gives is to the people that lead it, need it the least in the mortgage interest deduction. Um, that creates a huge tax break for those of us who own single family homes. What if that was repurposed in some way? It's a third rail, but uh, you know, that's certainly something the federal government could think about. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the TOC affordable requirement between the extremely low, the very low, and the low income, and the economics of what makes the deal work has led to essentially all of the approved affordable to be extreme low income and leaving out the very low income and the low income. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on that, and is there a potential to update the policy to encourage more like spread between the extremely low, the low, and the very low? Yeah. So that's for Kevin. Yeah, so I think uh, for those of you that have looked at it, everyone has, can, can select on the menu. You can do a low amount of extremely low units, a medium amount of very low units, uh, a high medium amount of low income units. Uh, those affordability thresholds were set in the initiative. The existence of extremely low income is not an option under state density bonus. So our prior density bonus had a higher percentage set aside and a higher income qualification. This uh, component, which was in the initiative, introduced extremely low income. There's even talk about a lower category than that. I think on one hand, it's really to address, I think we see a lot of you know, people in crisis, homelessness. That's obviously part of a pipeline of housing affordability. But um, I think what we've seen is the marketplace has selected, you know, following the money, the lowest number of, income, of, of units you can set aside. Mm -hmm. So I think on one hand, it's led to a lower percentage of units set aside, but it may have also led to a lot of um, uh, developers choosing to take advantage of the program. So under the TOC, we are not in a position to reallocate those percentages, more or less, but I think if there is a new program that's developed, it's important that we have seen people gravitate towards the lowest number no matter what the subsidy is. Um, I, the only thing I wanted maybe to hit on CEQA is SB 35 is a very important bill that deals with the, 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 somebody said the elasticity of housing supply. Federal government gave communities community development block grants in the 70s. They didn't say, this is kind of the state, right? They didn't say, here's how, this is the exact social program you should fund, where the federal government know how to do that. Similar to the state, the state could and is giving cities a regional housing allocation of these are the number of units we want you to build, here you go. If you are not following those allocations, we will start kicking into what is called SB 35, which will lead to by right approvals by local government. So right now the city of LA is in, um, we are, we are a, 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 a city that is meeting those allocations right now, but likely in the future with the increases that are being looked at in the governor, 
governor's office, I think a lot of cities will go into SB 35 status that might help with CEQA. It basically makes housing by right. And there's a good case up in the Bay Area in Cupertino uh, of a mall redevelopment project in the Valco Mall uh, where they created a uh, plan that was going to create a huge amount of community benefits, but they didn't want to do it, so the developer said, fine, we'll just use SB 35, mm -hmm. and that's what they're going to do. They're just going to override the local zoning by implementing or invoking SB 35. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's definitely a hammer that if you don't meet your allocation, then you're going to be in trouble. Anyway, we've run out of time. We probably could go for another hour on this, but I'd like to, if you could join me in, in thanking the panel, Con, Martha, Kevin, and Sharon. Thank you very much.